It is. It was called fight chase, not ghost chase. I'm sorry. Yeah. Big because the UFC is amazing at creating superstars and crushing them all in like a night. Sketchy dude outside, like smoking a cigarette. Looks like he'll take every dollar you have. Honestly, dude, the fact that you're talking about this right now is keeping me hell up. Yeah, like, yeah, I fight humans. I don't fight spirits, bro. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is the one we've all been waiting for. It is... It's good night, freaking Irene! Uh, let's get ready to rumble! Time! And those had enough people to fire truck out! We have been brought to you today by Siam Boxing. Siam Boxing on Instagram. Follow him. If you guys are looking for like training videos, all the stuff that's going on in Thailand, Siam Boxing, and he's also putting a little more effort into his YouTube channel. So that's going to be growing with a bunch of training clips of all the famous fighters over here, fighters from all over the world doing Muay Thai. So check them out. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Fight Chase Muay Thai MMA podcast. I'm your host, Kelly, from Fight Chase, here with my co-host, Kurt Brooks, from Cars and Kickboxing. And today, we have a special guest. Our special guest is a hang drum enthusiast, an artist, a UFC light heavyweight, and a good friend of ours, Khalil Roundtree Jr. Thank you for joining us. My pillar is what you have, somebody my cop. Yeah, see, that sounded real professional, didn't it? That's the first that time was, I've run That was super Thai. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> My pillow. Khalil, you are in Phuket right now. They're having the uh, Tiger tryouts for the Tiger fight team, uh, Tiger Muay Thai. And then you'll be back over here in Bangkok. So now we're calling uh, Thailand your home? All right. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, it's going to take a lot to get me out of this place, for sure. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, Cl- uh, Kurt gave me the bug, and, you know, you got the bug, and it's just like, once you're here, it's, it definitely bites into you, and you don't want to leave. You know, it, it's an amazing place. <sighs> yeah, it happens to everybody. I just had a two-hour conversation with two guys that did the same exact thing, so... Yeah, it seems get, common, you know, like a common thing. Like people come here and then they leave and they come back like, fuck. <laughs> yeah, no, like the first time I ever left, I felt like I was leaving something here and I, I had to come back like as soon as possible. <sighs> yeah, so, there's, like, there's something about it. I think people who haven't come here, like they need to come here. And yeah, <laughs> it's, it's amazing. Oh, we can't have everybody come here, though. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> like some people need to stay the hell out. <laughs> so, yeah, like I was saying, you haven't talked to Kurt in a long time. Uh, it got to be a few years, right? More yeah, than a few, man. I don't even remember the last time I saw you, Kurt. Like, it, damn, man, it's been forever. Yeah, it's been it's been a super long time. I it, it was kind of crazy because I remember seeing you at the gym, and then like the next time I saw you was on TV. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it was, yeah, it was pretty cool. Hell um, yeah. So uh, I get like what besides besides fighting out there in Thailand, what like what's the real appeal for you being down there? You know what? Like lately it's been a lot of just like the culture and like market shopping and exploring. I mean, like you guys know what it's like. You lived here, you've been here multiple times, like there's just something about like the markets and like the parks and the temples. It's just, and the people, you know, like there's so much to explore and so much to learn. So like aside from Muay Thai, like this place just has so many crazy, like hidden things and like ways of life and outlooks. And so it's like, that's, that's enough to just get lost in like without training. You get what I mean? You yeah. gotta watch, You got to watch out for those parks with those giant lizards though, buddy. Yeah, actually, I'm trying to, like, you know, 
I'm trying <laughs> to have that experience. So, <laughs> yeah. And once once I see a big old lizard, I'm going to snap a photo and share it with you guys and be like, hey, I'm on the team now. I, I got a big <laughs> lizard experience too. Dude, we could go over there next week. I'll take you over to the park. Yeah, let's do it. I'll ride one. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't get that close to them. They're big, like small alligators. So. Yeah, we just do the alligator thing. I would just jump on them and grab their <laughs> mouth and then take a picture and it'll be good to go. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was, I Instagram. saw. Got to do it for the gram, dude. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got to do it for the <laughs> likes. <laughs> I wonder how many likes that would get on Instagram. Like, probably like, for me, like 15,000. I've never hit 15,000. I think if I'm on top of a fucking Komodo dragon, I can get it. Oh, we yeah, we shout that out. That, uh, that's all you though. I mean, I don't know the UFC will like that. <laughs> nah, they can they can fuck themselves. <laughs> that's gonna be way worse than any weird stuff that we've been doing on top of skyscrapers and all that. Cause that thing bites you. Yeah, well, we gotta keep like raising the bar, man. Like skyscraper, yeah, yeah. like that was like, you know, I had some people that live in Thailand, like, oh, that's illegal, blah blah yeah. blah. I'm like, okay, cool. Well, if I ride on top of a Komodo dragon, that's like next level. Yeah, that I mean, it's reincarnation over here, so you might be riding on like a legendary fighter, and there might be a battle. It could be, it could be a great story. I mean, if you think about it, yeah, like come <laughs> on, man, I think it's worth it. All right, next 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 Wednesday we'll be coming live from Luini <laughs> Park. <laughs> please oh. have the phone ready to call the hospital, please. Oh no, we're doing it live, so somebody else will have to call for us because I can't turn it <laughs> off in the middle. You know, come on. <laughs> You, you guys should go into that uh that ghost tower that you guys uh were climbing up. Oh, uh, so yeah, I mean, like, uh, what we're I mean, for anybody that's listening now that wants to hear the Khalil story of the UFC and his climb to fame in the UFC and and all that um, amazing things that he's done. Well, we're friends with Khalil. Uh, Kurt and I have trained with him. We're good friends with Khalil, so we're not going to touch on that stuff too much. We're we're going to go into the modern Khalil, what's coming up, um, the person behind, you know, the UFC stardom. So that's what we're going with. So what Kerr is referring to is, is I had visited the Ghost Tower. It's an abandoned sky rise in Bangkok uh, a few weeks ago. And when Khalil told me that he's going to be back in Bangkok because he was in the States, he, I said, hey, we should go to this, this Ghost Tower. And uh, Khalil, you're not, you're not too... Um, keen on ghosts i i from what i've gathered when we were there but <laughs> <laughs> it's a 49 story empty tower skyscraper in the middle of bangkok and uh what well, what did you think when we went in there khalil like i mean you know? at first i was like i mean the whole way through i was like super excited it's really cool and like when we showed up, there's just, like, some sketchy dude outside, like, smoking a cigarette. Looks like he'll take every dollar you have. And, Kelly, like, you seem like you were friends with the dude. You're like, hey, what up? I'm back. <laughs> you know, I'm like, oh, shit. Like, Kelly's out here doing, like, mafia business. <laughs> and then the guy, like, the guy's like, okay, cool, blah, blah, blah. We do our business. He lets us in. He's like, okay, you got one hour. And, Kelly, you're so casual. You're like, ah, we'll go up there for, like, three. I'm like, dude, this guy looks like he'll shoot us. You're like, what the hell? But um, overall, like, it was really cool. Um, I'd never been in, like, an abandoned building like that. And just to, like, just to do the climb and see, like, the top of Bangkok, like, I love this city to death. So to see it from that perspective was awesome. Um, it wasn't, like, as sketchy as I thought it was going to be. Um, but I still wasn't trying to go into, like, you know, the, the same room where, like, the guy hung himself. You're like, oh, let's go. I'm like, yeah, I'd rather not. <laughs> I'd rather not. But overall, like, it was a really cool experience. Like, I'd love to go back and, you know, and just, like, check it out, hang out. Yeah, I'm going to send you a picture. Like, because you didn't go on on the 40, 43rd floor. Um, they had found a person that hung himself, and this was many years ago, and that's when they – Decided they were going to make it illegal to go in there. It was too dangerous. And now you kind of pay your way in. And what Khalil's talking about, like, there's a security guard there. And if you pay him, they kind of go, oh, we didn't see you. And they open a door for you to get up the stairs. And like <laughs> like, like you were saying, he, he's, he, he gave us an hour. And, and I'm like, nah, we'll just stay however long we want. And the reason I said that, that guy, was, did you see the cases of beer they had? They yeah. had cases of beer. He wasn't coming up there to get us. So I didn't care how long we were going to be up there. How much bot did you give him? 
It was five hundred a piece. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So Which well, is big money. <laughs> yeah, I mean well think about it. We were we saw a few other people who were up there, so they're making, you know, ten thousand or something a day, I would oh, imagine. Easy, easy money for so, sure. But on the forty third floor I I told Khalil and our other friend, I was like, Oh, let's go down here. This is where the guy hung himself and guess what? I went alone. So <laughs> they, yeah, they you went... <laughs> bet your ass you went alone. Like what the fuck? <laughs> I and the reason I went alone because the first time I didn't even really go on that floor, but the second time through is I'm going to put together like a documentary style, um, more of the backstory of the building of a video. So I wanted to get video of the floor, which is real sketchy because honestly, before I came to Thailand, I wasn't really into the spirit stuff. But being in Thailand, both of you have experienced it now. Is they're super into spiritual ghosts and things like that. So when I went there, I was like, man, I don't really know if I want to be messing with this. So I went down the hallway, Khalil, and I went into every single room. And the reason is, is I could not find any information on which room the guy was in. Yeah, and, you don't need it. <laughs> <laughs> and so I went into a room. I'm going to have to send you the picture. And there's like a makeshift ladder in the because this happened in a bathroom, like pushed up against a, a counter. And then there was a wire hanging from the ceiling. Honestly, dude, the fact that you're talking about this right now just creeps me the hell out. <laughs> when I walked in there and I, I'm talking to the camera, I'm like, all right, I, this is possibly where it happened or that somebody could – I got to go. I didn't stay long. I was like, where did they go? So I had to, I came right upstairs like not too long after. But, yeah, I did see that kind of stuff. Yeah, and, then, and there's a reason why the first time you went alone, you didn't go in the room. But you thought you had some protection this time. <laughs> but guess what? You were wrong, buddy. You were wrong. <laughs> The big bad yeah. fighter like ghosted me. He was on the yeah, he- like yeah. I fight humans. I don't fight <laughs> spirits, bro. <laughs> Khalil was on the roof looking at the scenery, and I'm hunting ghosts. So yeah, Maybe you can do that. Like it, it, it's called fight ghost. chase, not ghost chase. Today. I'm sorry, yeah. bro. <laughs> if you told me there's like somebody on the third, forty floor, third floor that I could fight and throw hands with, I'd be like, oh yeah, let's go. But you're like, oh, there's a ghost. I'm like, nah, dude, you can go do it on your own. <laughs> Next time I'll, I won't tell you. I'm like, oh wait, a minute. we gotta check out the the graffiti on this floor. I won't tell you. Yeah. Where floor, right? <laughs> and next yeah, time, I... the next time you tell me anything about graffiti, I'm gonna <laughs> use that. I, that's like code word for ghost. <laughs> yeah, right. But yeah, I mean, it was amazing. I loved going up there and, and sharing it. And that's like a few of the other things that I've gotten to do with you, Khalil. Like, uh, Kurt actually showed me. He took me to Wat Arun the first time. And I fell in love with that temple, man. I, I, that's like my temple in Bangkok that I have to go to almost every time I'm in Bangkok. And that's why I wanted to show you that temple. It was like, this is my temple that I love. And I wanted to make sure that you saw that temple so you could like start there. And I mean, that was one of the first temples that you got to see while you were out here, other than with the Petendi guys, right? Yeah. And when I like, I took photos and like shared it with my family and stuff. And like, I mean, that temple alone is one of the most beautiful in its own way. You know, like a lot of them have like a lot of gold and like sparkly stuff. And this one is just like straight, like hand painted, detailed. Like, honestly, it's it's so hard to even describe how beautiful this place is. So, yeah, it's it's definitely up there in the in in my top favorites as well. Yeah, I wrote a I wrote a post for my website a while back and it was like my first love in Bangkok. And it's because like it's that first thing that really stuck out like we Kurt. We stayed right near Kosan, and we didn't stay in Bangkok for very long, and Kosan didn't stick out. That was like, I didn't want to be anywhere near that place. <laughs> but we went to the temple, and I was like, man, there was something so peaceful and so beautiful about the temple being right on the river. And it's like, so that was my first love in Bangkok, and I always go and revisit it. So I will actually, so when I'm going back to the States next Friday, I will have to go back to uh, Wat Arun. And there's a reason, too. Kurt? posted a picture before I ever came out here of him on the steps going up to the top, those really steep steps that I showed you, Khalil. Yeah. Every time I have been back there, I have not been allowed to go on those steps. They've been closed <laughs> off. <laughs> I have been there at least 12 times. The one time that the steps were open, they closed them as I got there because of a lightning storm coming in. Oh, oh man. man. I was like, this is, there's like, it's maybe that's the reason I have to keep going back. It's like one day I'll get on those steps and one day you'll be able to climb up them. <laughs> yeah, and that'll be one the, day. It'll be the end of my story. So, <laughs> <laughs> but, 
the conclusion, you know what? I finally got to walk up the stairs. <laughs> yeah. And then fell in the water with all those crazy fish. Oh, man. <laughs> <sighs> so, I mean, so what brought you, Khalil, to Bangkok? Was it a lot of people, uh, including myself at first, the, the idea was that you had had your fight, you found a hole in your game, and you figured – the hole in your game was a clinch game in Muay Thai, and where better to go fix that hole in your game would to come to Thailand where they the motherland of Muay Thai. Yeah, I mean like that's like a really big piece of like what brought me there. But um, you know, like when you guys first met me like ten years ago and I started training MMA, my initial like my initial thing that I wanted to do was Muay Thai. Like I never, ever, ever wanted to grapple and <laughs> I didn't like, it just wasn't really like appealing to me. I mean, like I have the love and respect for it now, but like when I first started and wanted to lose weight, like I bought a pair of Muay Thai shorts from Panda at OTM. You know what I mean? Like I <laughs> yep. went to go train MMA, but I didn't even buy MMA shorts. Like I bought a pair of yellow and black Muay Thai shorts. And like, when I joined, when I joined one fight team, like I, my first class was a Muay Thai class. And so like, I've always wanted to do it. I've always had like a love and like a, a draw, like a, a calling to fight Muay Thai. But at Vanderlei's, like we were kind of like, I don't want to say forced, but like encouraged to do everything. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, um, you know, just for my whole journey through all of this fighting stuff, like I've always wanted to come to Thailand and really like, my thing was like everybody everybody who pretty much knows nothing is like oh tiger muay thai right like when for me i thought thailand i thought tiger muay thai that was like all i knew yeah but as i grew as a fighter and as a mixed martial artist um i was just like ah oh, like there's more than tiger muay thai so after losing and wanting to sharpen up my my game like i had a whole list of of gyms that i wanted to check out and, like, Tiger Muay Thai at this point was, like, all the way at the bottom of the list. Good. <laughs> and so, I yeah, I knew that, like, if I wanted to get better at Muay Thai, I'd have to be at a place where they have active Muay Thai, like, fighters and champions. And then that's when I, like, found Pechendi in Bangkok. So, like, once I went there, it was, like, it was a wrap. Like, they had the best fighters. They had the best facility. They, like, took me in with open arms. They taught me, like, Thai culture, like, everything. So, Literally being there is like that was what he, like held me here. You get me? Yeah. Who else was on the list? Do you remember? Um, yeah, I had I had Sit Song Pinong on the list. I had Yakao on the list. I had Sit Jiao Po, and I had uh, one more, one more. Um, Sit Mon Chai. Oh, that's a great gym. Yeah, it's a great gym, and like. I know Kevin Ross. I know um, my friend Chaz Mulkey, who trained at Sitsong Pinong. Um, but those guys, like those guys, were the ones I looked up to. And there was something about their Muay Thai and way of training that really inspired me. Like before they hit pads, before they spar anything in the states, they go run. Like they run like five to ten k. Yeah. And I'd never seen people do that before. And I felt like ah, these guys got that from somewhere. Like, you know, like. And I know that they went to Thailand, so I'm like, maybe because they went to Thailand is why they have this, like, discipline that before they even go run or before they even go train, they run every single day. And that's something, like, for me, like, I never came up with that type of discipline. Like, we show up to the gym, we wrap our hands, and then we warm up by running around the mat. You get me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, like, I knew <laughs> that they got it from somewhere else, and I knew that they got it from Thailand. So, like, that that was kind of another part of my calling to come here was, like, I wanted to develop this new type of discipline um, before, like even before I start training, like I want to be able to run and have the focus of like, you know, of these guys that I looked up to. You think you got it? Yeah, definitely. Like I definitely know now what it takes to, to get in, in fight shape mentally and emotionally, you know what I mean? And I, yeah. not, not just by running, you get me? Like, it's not just that. But it's just like it's just a different it's just a different mindset, man. Like these these Thai fighters, like they live it, they breathe it, they sleep it. You know, like it's 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 just a whole another way of life. And the only way to really absorb that and learn it is to be around it, in my opinion. Like 
you can you can learn a little bit of it by watching videos and stuff but like unless you're here and know what it's like to be in that position you know now i feel like i can go anywhere in the world and get ready for a fight yeah i believe like a lot of people come out to thailand for a week to a month yeah and i i don't think it's long enough that's long enough for a fitness vacation oh for sure you know and and you get a, a taste of it but you were where? Three months, right? You were three months at Petendi before you even went to Phuket? Yes, exactly. I mean, that's a legit camp. Like, you're there. You're getting the culture. You're getting it driven into. You were telling me you were running by, by the Grand Palace every morning at sunrise. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, that's far beyond running down the street in, you know, the middle of Vegas. Yeah, like, well, it's just a few – like, it's already a few miles to get from Petch and D to Grand Palace. So we would have to run from the gym to Grand Palace. And then once we got to Grand Palace, we were required to run around minimum four times, which that alone is already, like <laughs> – I don't know, dude. Like, it's a few miles. You get me? Like, yeah. So, yeah, it, but it's different. <laughs> where you're running is literally, like, the one of the most sacred places to Thai people. Oh, exactly. Sacred, beautiful – peaceful like even though it's in the middle of the city at 5 a.m running around that place like it's literally silent you know like you hear like there's a few cars but you hear like birds chirping you see monks doing their like daily morning walk like it's literally the the most peaceful which is weird because it's a dead center of the city it's one of the most peaceful things that you can experience and like for me i remember the first few days of like running around it i was like damn dude like this is crazy like this is like this is what it's like to be a fighter. Like I don't know why it took for me to run around a building to feel like I was a fighter. I mean, I fought in a cage in front of like thousands of people, you know. Yeah. But, like just that alone, I was like, wow. Like not even fighter, but like martial artist. Like there was something about that run in the morning that really brought my connection to like what it means to be like a martial artist. It, it was it was cool. It's it's yeah, a different yeah, world. I feel here. like what was that? It's just a different world here. Yeah. I was going to say, yeah, it's really contagious. Just like the energy that the Thai fighters have and that, you know, Thailand just has in general. It's just like a real calming, peaceful thing. And I I feel like you don't really, it's so much different than uh, in the States. When you're training in the States, it's so much different of an energy. Yeah, I feel like the the training in the states is really like machismo, right? Like, ah, oh, like yes, <laughs> I'm powerful, I'm strong, and grind, 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 grind. I'm like, dude, shut up already, you know? Like, <laughs> these guys, like these guys, work their asses off every single day. You know, like if if they get tired or hurt, like you know, they don't really complain too much about it. They're just like, ah, oh, this is like a part of the life. And like, what really blew my mind is my first fight ever that i've been to in thailand was like it was outdoors and my friend was fighting and they literally had red and blue corner under the same tent everybody getting their hands wrapped just like talking to each other and i'm like wait the blue corner is right there and they're like yeah like we all like we're all in the same thing like what are you talking about and i'm like well we have to be separated for like an entire week before we fight (laughs) you know what i mean and like so there's no like there's no bad energy or like guys like trying to one up each other or anything it's like they let their skills show in in the ring and then also like before and after the fight there's just so much respect and peace and then like i don't know man it's just it's crazy like even when they're fighting it's very rare i probably only seen one time where like two guys were actually like you know like showing off to each other or like you know where there was like some like ego involved but other than that, like these these guys are kicking each other's asses and still showing like mad levels of respect. So that blew my mind. 100%. Yeah, we just did a podcast on that, like the traditions and the respect that's being lost with the rise of MMA. And it's and and if you come to Thailand, we were, I, we quote you know kind of talked about a lot of that, and it's just the respect level. You know, when they're done with a fight, you know, if you win a fight, you still are on your knees and you're bowing to your opponent at the end of the fight. You know, and it's uh, real. It's like it's a hundred percent real. You know what I mean? It's not like, oh, I'm gonna do this because, like, because you beat me. Like, no, like these dudes actually show like real respect, and it's, dude, it's so crazy. It's, it's so, so crazy to experience. In the states, okay, so you you have firsthand experience now of a UFC crowd, 
Yeah. And a Raja crowd. Okay. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so now here, here's the thing. So what you just explained is like harmony, peace, respect before a fight. The two fighters are sitting next to each other. And I've seen this firsthand with like eight year olds. They're sitting in the same little plastic chairs before they go in the ring. Like yeah. right next to each other. There's no mean mugging. There's no talking crap to each other. The corners are talking with each other. There's, you know, obviously you're for your fighter, but there's none of the animosity that we create in the States. And now you've been in the opposite of that. Um, I don't remember which fight it was, but you said there was a little animosity. Usually you're, you don't have to really play into that. But in one of your fights, you said that there was a, a little bit of that, you know, going on before the fights. But you've seen, say, a, you know, a Connor situation. Yeah. But when you're in an arena like Raja and you feel that energy, even all of that wild energy that's going on at Raja that people really can't understand unless you've been there, it still feels posititive. Oh, it's, 100%. It's not 100%. the people, it's not a kill energy, right? Like, it no, doesn't, no. It feels it's, like it's everything more like, is positive. Like the, like, the fans are genuinely, like, intrigued. And for, like, for Raja versus, like, UFC, UFC, I, I think the maximum I've ever fought in front of it was, like, 20,000 people, right? And, and Raja, like, I don't even think it fits that many people. I'd say, like, maybe a third of the, like, you know what I mean? Like, maybe yeah. a third will sell out that place. But, like, that place is electric. Like, per punch, like, they're, like, cheering. And, like, you know what I mean? And it's, like, I never hear booing. You never hear people, like, oh, you kill him. Crush <laughs> yeah, him. Like, exactly. No, it's, like, it's it's all, like, they respect the skill. They respect the, the martial art. And, it, and yeah, I don't even it, want to call it, like, a sport. Like, it's fighting. It's not sports. You know what I mean? Like, it's, like, it's a martial art. And they respect it. And... You know what I mean? Like, if the guy wins or loses, like, they still pay respects. And, and it, yeah, it's like, what the crazy thing about it is what I what I love the most is when I came here, it's not about, like, what's your record? Oh, you've never lost? It's like, no, like, how many fights do you have? Like, you get me? Like, that's really what's important is, like, what makes you, not even what makes you good, but, like, you are recognized really on, like, how many times have you stepped in there and and give your all <laughs> you know yeah. like it, yeah it's 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 so different man it's so i told different. you before i had a crew here that was talking to me he's like do you want to fight and i'm older i'm older than both you guys and i've never fought kurt's fought you fought on the highest level but this crew was telling me he's like you want to fight and i'm like yeah eventually i do want to have a fight just you know as a person and you know being a martial artist i want to go to i would love to have a muay thai fight and he said Okay, if you want to do it, you train. He goes, but listen, in Muay Thai, it's 90% heart and 10% of your skill. And like in the UFC now, you're seeing, all right, it's 90% your skill, 10% your heart. You could tap out at any time. I've never seen anybody tap out in a Muay Thai fight. <laughs> you know, oh, I, yeah, there's never. no give up. It's all heart. And, and another thing to talk about you were saying with the crowd and Raja, they're cheering, right, for every strike. They're yeah. not they're not cheering for red or blue corner. Only those corners, right? Your corner men are cheering that back and forth. But the yeah. whole crowd, every strike is oi me. <laughs> you know, it's every it's the whole energy. It's not just my team against your team. It's the action of Muay Thai. Yeah, 100%. And I mean like you got obviously like you got the betters which like that is a whole another thing in its own cuz it's like where else in the world do you have people that literally make a living off of watching fights and betting on fights? And even if they're betting on red or blue corner, like there's still no animosity, like whether or not the guy loses, like, damn me, this guy might've lost his money or whatever. But like, you get me? It's like, there's nothing, there's nothing really personal. It's like, Hey, you know what? I think you're the better fighter. I'm going to bet some money on you. And like, whatever like it's it's just oh my god man and it's crazy is like the odds people if the people have never seen it the odds that are set are changing throughout the whole fight so minute to minute <laughs> and there's no central bookie everybody could be their own bookie everybody could be their own betting agent and you can set your own odds who you want to bet with i mean there's main guys that do a lot of the money handling but if if you and i wanted to bet and i give you four to one or something like that because one guy's doing better and then the next round it changes and i can change my odds if you want to bet with me on that round. And another thing that happens is with the Y crew in the beginning. Yeah. 
the betters see that the people that are betting and they want to see who's more comfortable, who they think yeah. is going to have more power. That starts your betting odds. It how really you, does. You, like, how you do this traditional of, like, dance balance and strength. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. Yeah. And people don't see all of like what's going on. And then you go into the UFC and like we've talked, you got to jump around. You got to be tough. You can't be with the guy for the week before, but it's the energy in the UFC is, is a primal, uh, I mean, I've been to UFC events when I lived in Vegas, a bunch of them. I've seen Conor fight, and the, the energy is a primal kill energy. It's a, it's not a, that it's a negative, but it's not a positive. No, yeah, for sure. And it's like the whole, it's it's all about like, oh, like, I want to be the best in the world. And I want to be the champion, and like, no one can say this or do this, and I'm untouchable, and I'll never lose. And it's just like, get over it. Yeah. Like, get over it. Like. Dude, to, like, obviously, like, cool. Like, you never lost. Like, that's that's awesome. But, like, dude, it, like, it's so much more than that. You know what I mean? And, like, I don't know. It's, like, you got people watching, and it just, like, I feel like UFC. I'm going to say it. I, I, I fight for the UFC. This could, like, fucking cost me my job. Who cares? But it's, it's like, it's literally just, like, it's all about, like, it's it's a very selfish sport you know what i mean like yeah i don't even want to say mma but just like how ufc has become it's like okay i'm the champion now i want to be the double champion and the triple champion and fuck you and fuck you and fuck you like you know what i mean it's not like it has no there's no real like respect for the actual sport or the fans or the people watching or like the growth it's like you know what i'm in this for myself by myself and i want to get as rich as possible and do whatever I want to do. You know what I mean? There's yeah. no there's no tradition in MMA. No, what's not at tradition? all. Tradition. Please tell me what's the tradition? There's and I've, not. I've said the same thing with that. Like you say tradition, and I've talked to Kurt and like the allure of Thailand for me. Um, I love tradition. When I was young, I liked you know history and things like that in the United States. Well, our history in the United States one is very tainted with a lot of things that we've done throughout history, and it's very short. So American culture is is very, very young. But if you come to a place like Thailand and you go to a temple that's been there 200 years and it's still in pristine condition and you see things that are done that were done you know, 500 years ago and you have warrior cultures here. Like where did Muay Thai come from? Muay Baran, hand-to-hand combat that's depicted yeah. on Angkor Wat's walls. Like, <laughs> I mean, this isn't UFC. This is some real culture and that's what the like the huge thing to me was but i have a question like so before you went came here to thailand what was your mindset being a top level fighter you're on the rise you want like you just said you know uh everybody's concerned about being unbeaten and having the belt and things like that and that's all you hear in this in ufc yeah. I want to be the best. I'm the like you were saying. I'm the two division champion. I'm the three division. Whatever it is, that's the the motivation. That's the bottom line. That's you know money fights. Uh, again, Connor just kind of blew that all out of the water. The rating, you know, the ranking system is basically horseshit now. But <laughs> I mean, it, what it, ranking it, system? It, yeah, exactly. <laughs> the, the, the numbers that they put in front of people's names really mean nothing. Um, oh, the the popularity list. I got it, you exactly. Yeah. yeah. It should just say, like, how many followers you have. That should be, like, what – instead of a rank, it should say, like, this guy has 100,000 Instagram followers. That should no, be no, how- it should be – no, it should just be, like, favorites. Like, oh, you're our favorite. Well, that's – yeah, your Instagram should show that, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look at it. Like, Johnny Bones Jones has I don't know how many millions, so he should be number one. He should have the belt just from that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but what I'm saying is, like, so before you came here, what was your mindset – as a as a prize fighter, as a, as a MMA fighter, like like you were saying, were you in that kind of mindset that that was the course of your career? Like you needed to be the best, fight unbeaten, that kind of thing. No, uh, I mean like those were those were like inner conversations that would come up. But to be a hundred percent like honest and raw, my mindset before coming here was, what the fuck am I doing? Okay. Like why do I even do this? Like I like nothing. Like, this doesn't line up with who I am. Like, why am I doing this? I was in so much question about, like, like why do I want to be doing this? Like, why am I in this? Like, 
you get me like i yeah. just i was so lost man like and that's why and it was like at a time where like i had just gotten knocked out like i trained my ass off for a fight i i mean like i wasn't really all the way there but i was like you know what like this is my job like whatever and i got knocked out and like that for me it's like man i spent all this time training and like i showed up to the fight i didn't want to be there i told my corners before i was going to fight that like i knew i was going to lose like there was so much stuff man that happened like the night that i lost my fight and then like like literally the day after i'm just like i don't know what it was but literally i woke up the day after like i need to go to thailand and oh. at this point like and this was before i watched the tape before i thought like i got to get better at the clinch like all of this stuff I literally, the morning after my fight, swollen face and everything, I was looking at flights to Thailand. And at the time, like, the girl that I was with, like, she had, like, she didn't know that I was going to go anything. And I had literally, I was one click away from purchasing a ticket to coming here without even knowing why. It just yeah. something was like, go to fucking Thailand. And... Yeah, so I was lost, man. I really was. And then I came here and, like, I learned some tradition. I learned – I just saw a whole new, like, perspective and beauty in fighting. And I learned how to fight the way that I want to fight. And now it's like I've got a whole new drive and, like, passion to step back in there. Yeah, we all know it showed. Everyone <laughs> – I mean, everyone, whether they knew you personally or not, was like, oh, my God. You know, yeah. and I was with you for, you know, almost a month before it and – I was as like a vested interest, you know, like you're my friend. We became real close. And then I'm sitting here, you're all the way back in the States and I'm like watching on TV and, and it came out so flawlessly. I was like, Oh my God, like it, that worked. And it worked amazingly, you know, because you don't know you, like you said, you, the fight before you, you went through everything and you thought you were doing everything right. And you were ready to fight and it didn't work, you know, but this, I think, the mindset and everything played into to uh, yeah you know, but you know, here's one thing too that like that i've never shared and it's it's like it's a true and honest feeling is like you know the the crazy thing is like yeah I, I went in there and it worked you know but it worked that time and now like because people saw that i'd done this big move and like there i've made like major changes like now i'm held to that expectation yeah. So like, say I go in there and I lose my next fight, like then they're gonna be like, "Oh, fucking shouldn't have went to Thailand, you fucking yeah, yeah. idiot. This is MMA. <laughs> you need to be blah 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 and do, 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 do. and whatever MMA fans or UFC fans fucking do." Yeah, exactly. But the real ones, like I'm sure that they'll show like respect and like constant support, which is like awesome because I do have a really good like following of like real fans, but. I'm like, I'm kind of he held to this like expectation, which it's kind of like, I'm nervous a little bit because like now I'm kind of expected to perform even better than my last performance. And like, to be honest, like the way life works, like who knows if it'll happen again? Like, oh, I yeah. don't know. But yeah. for that time, like it did. Um, but you know, like whatever, man, I know that right now, like I'm doing what makes me happy, you know, regardless of a win or a loss or a champion or whatever people strive for i know that i'm living my life happily and i'm training in a place that i love and i'm living in a place that i love and to me like that's all that fucking matters you know yeah i, I agree with that on that but like when you came so that was your mindset before once you got here and once after this like you established you know that wow this is muay thai and this is the culture and things like that did it adjust like change your perspective on what your career path in like in UFC or in fighting in general should be? Well, I mean, in a way, like I've definitely got new ideas, right? Like um, I would love to only fight Muay Thai. Like that would really? be sick. That means that I could fight, you know, three times a month. You get yeah. me? And like, <laughs> yep. <laughs> and I could win a bunch of times and I could lose a bunch of times, but I could fight a bunch of times. You get me? Like, oh, yeah. And, and fight in a style and in a tradition that, like, to me is like, it's very, like, fulfilling. Yeah. You get me? Like, I oh, know yeah. for me, honestly, like, fighting in the UFC, it, it can tug on my heart a lot because of the pressure, because of the, the expectation of winning all the time. Like, it's so 
winning focused. And if you don't win, then you're shit. And if you win, then you're the greatest in the world. And if you win three times or four times in a row, then you got people like, oh, you're the GOAT. And it's like, go fuck yourself. Like, I don't even have enough fights to even be in the line of people who are considered the greatest in the world. Like, as soon as I have more than 500 fights, then maybe put me in that boat. (laughs) Yeah. You (laughs) get me? Like, but, like, people don't realize, like, yeah. So, I don't know, man. It's, like, it's definitely opened my mind to a lot of, like, other things. Like, you know, like, if if I go and I completely blow my next few fights and the UFC cuts me, like, cool well at least i know now that like if i want to continue fighting obviously i won't make the same amount of money but if i want to continue fighting i can come here and i can fight twice a day twice a week if i want to you know what i mean and like and it really like and it really filled my spirit like my fighting spirit maybe i won't be you know quote unquote famous or whatever but who gives a shit like i get to do something that i like to do and that's all that matters and so yeah, like I said, that's the only like perspective that it really opened up is that I can actually enjoy fighting. Well, it gave you a a life after the UFC. Yeah, hundred you know, percent. Because 100%. the way that you've described it and other people have described it is, you got, you know, if you lose three fights, you don't have a job. That's three days. <laughs> that's only three days, and you lose your job at making yeah. your life sit. You know, you're living. Three days. That's yeah. bullshit. What yeah. other job do you go and you call in sick three days and you don't have a job? I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot, but like it's it would definitely take. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> it would take more than just calling in sick. Like you'd have to be a really shit person. Yeah, but you know <laughs> what I'm saying? Yeah, but you if you have three bad days at work, if you fuck something up three days, if you're a fucking if you're working in like a nuclear plant and you melt the place down but yeah come on, you know exactly but a three-day thing that's huge to, for a human to yes. just comprehend so for you to go okay i can win the next two fights and i have I, they can offer me more money or they can you know continue my career but if they don't i still have something that's going to fulfill my spirit it's got to be huge yeah i mean as a human as as a person as as a person that i know who you are as you know being more than just this guy that comes to the gym that's the big guy that wants to beat people up. You know, that's not that's not Khalil that I know. Um, that anybody that knows you, they know that that's not you, that you're way deeper than that. To be able to have something that fulfills your warrior spirit and your spirit as a person, it's got to be big because the UFC is amazing at creating superstars and crushing them all in, like, a night. Oh, for uh, sure. Uh, I mean... We've all met Cyborg, and she's... I mean, dude, honestly, the the perfect example is Ronda Rousey. Yeah. I always use her as an example. Like, they still show her, like, they show her respect, you know what I mean? Like, and they always, you know, they have her pictures still and all that stuff. But, like, dude, when she was on, she was on, bro. Oh, yeah. She was on you everything. You know what I mean? Like, oh, the best female athlete in the entire world, unstoppable, blah, 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 gets beat two times and then it's just like oh we were kidding never mind we were just kidding (laughs) yeah you know like they have this way of like immortalizing people without even like without our permission yeah (laughs) you know what i mean it's like the oh you're so good oh this guy dude i've been through it like and the ultimate fighter like body kicked the guy like when he was down all this stuff and it's just like oh khalil roundtree like prospect fucking this guy's gonna be the the knockout artist of the century and then, like, I go in there and I lose my first two fights in the UFC. And they're like, actually, this guy sucks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we're yeah. just, we're just UFC, joking. The UFC never said that. But just, like, <laughs> you know, just, like, comments and fans and, like, yeah. media outlets and stuff. And then it's like, dude, I've had, I've, I've had eight fights in the UFC. And obviously, they've been, like, ups and downs. But, like, I've never cracked the rankings. Yeah, that's know? ridiculous. And, like, it's, it's, it's. I've never cracked the rankings. Like, there's guys on the on the UFC video game. Like, I think Gokan Saki's even on the video game, and like he has two fights in the UFC, bro. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I have eight, and I beat him, and I'm not in the game. Yeah, I remember you were pretty bitter, and you wouldn't play the game because you're not in it. Yeah, it's like <laughs> it's like damn, that sucks. But like, okay, Gokan Saki, like he has oh he has a whole country following him. Okay, cool. So that's what it takes. Is like. 
you know, you got to be able to have a bunch of people, which is fine. That's business. Like it brings the money. Cool. But like that to me shows me like, you know what, dude, it's not about the sport. It's not, not fuck sport. Cause fighting is not a sport. It's not about the martial art. Yeah. It's not really like, it's not really based off of what they claim is like, Oh, honor, respect, strength, discipline. Like that's their mantra. It's like, come on, dude, get over it. It's not about that. You know, like it's not. I, and, I like watched I don't an- know I don't know many fighters that even can like can even like claim that that mantra or that thing that they try to brand. You get me? Like I don't yeah. I don't I can't watch UFC and be inspired. Like man, this guy's like this dude's an honorable guy. He's an honorable champion. Man, this champion shows so much respect. Like dude, where do I go to find that? I can't. <laughs> well, know? even uh, Gudo, he was doing. Like, he was a decent guy, uh, Henry, but now oh, he's a awesome. douchebag. Yeah, like, okay. Oh, he's just like, a Burger King like, guy. <laughs> exactly. For instance, dude, like, like, that was someone, like, who I, like, in the beginning, before the champion, before all that stuff, like, dude, like, I thought he was a great guy. And yeah. even till this day, like, I can talk to him, like, personally, I understand that what he's doing is, like, just business and all right. that stuff. Like, I think that Henry Cejudo is a great person. I really do. But, like, to get the belt and to get the dub, like to get two belts and like do all this stuff and then try to like sell a fight and promote and make more money. Like to me, I see it. I'm like, okay, dude, respect, like go get your money, go make your bread, go get relevant. But on the other hand, like in the inside where my heart needs is like inspiration for like what, like say I do become a champion, you know, like, now it's just I got a blank canvas. Like it's literally just up to me. Like I don't have an example of a champion who I want to be like. Yeah. You know what I mean? Or who I want to learn from or whatever. You get me? Like yeah. Not even John Jones. You know what I mean? Like the only one to be honest is Anderson Silva. Yeah. And that's because that's the only person that through thick and thin and through ups and downs, he's remained a legit martial artist. He's always been himself. No matter he's what. He's always been himself. He's always show respect. His respect is genuine. You know what I mean? Like he's always goes in there and, and does his thing and, and uses his style and, you know, all this stuff. And he's done a little bit of things to try to get fights, like, you know, trying to fight Connor and stuff like big money fights. But hey, at the end of the day, it's still martial arts. And he never disrespected anybody. Like he never talks crap to try to get a fight. Like he'll he'll say, Hey, I want to fight Connor. I think that'd be a great fight cool but he never said like oh connor you're a bitch or you're this or you're that it's like no like he'll ask for it he'll put the the he'll put the the you know the feelers out there but he won't cross the line as far as like doing anything or he'll never he'll never like self-proclaim being the goat (laughs) like yeah he he is feel it (laughs) yeah he, he he may know it and he may feel it but you never see him boasting about it ever and that's what i said go ahead kurt Oh, I was going to say, it's kind of crazy, though, because I see a lot of times when they talk about the greatest of all time, I always think Anderson Silva. But when I see the list, oftentimes, like, people aren't even talking about him. I think it's just crazy. Everybody's talking about John Jones like the, like Anderson Silva never existed. <laughs> yeah, but do you want to know why? It's because the people only repeat what they see and what they hear. Yeah. UFC is not talking about Anderson Silva no more. As far as, they, as far as they're concerned, he's a fucking old, washed-up guy. And when it's time for him to fight, then it's like, ah, uh, the former champion, like former goat, like all this stuff. And it's like, yeah, but like, you know, in between, it's like we hear nothing of Anderson Silva. We see no posts about Anderson Silva, his lifestyle, his legacy, nothing. It's like it's constantly just promoting fights, promoting what's hot, getting asses in the seats, getting eyes on the pay-per-views. And that's it, which, like I said, I don't know the business. I don't know how it works and, and what it takes to grow. Like, I can't really talk shit. All I can say is, like, this is what I see. And this is kind of like what puts me in the mindset that I'm in, you know? Yeah. I, and look at this way. When you when you were on the couch, you were on the couch, Panda was on his couch, Kurt was on his couch, all of you wanted to be UFC fighters. I didn't want to be a UFC fighter because when it came out, I was old. So anyways, <laughs> <laughs> but when you guys were there, you could look to a Rich Franklin who was a school teacher. You could look to a Matt Hughes who was a farmer. You could look to an Anderson Silver who was a martial artist. You could look to guys that were legitimate people that you could look up to that had – 
presented themselves well, that carried themselves well, that had something behind them. Now you look at these guys. John Jones is an amazing fighter, but coke addict or whatever hell happened. He's getting in accidents. He's getting arrested. That's not what I want the kid looking, sitting on the couch looking at and going, I'm going to do that. That's not going to inspire kids to be better. Yeah. It's an entertainment now. It's the same shit that you're going to see in professional wrestling. You're going to see it promoted the same way. You're going to see the good guys ride to the top. You're going to see the bad guys take over. You know, that's why they love John Jones. He's got such a, you know, love-hate relationship with everybody. He could be so bad, but he's still going to put, you know, asses in the seats. So it's, it's UFC has, in my mind, has tainted uh, MMA. And like I've told Kurt, I stopped watching UFCs when I moved over here last year. Yeah. Like I, I, I watched maybe three the whole time I've been here. Yeah, I know what you mean. And, like, I mean, like, I don't know, man. It's it's crazy because, like, I don't know. I don't know John personally. And, like, we're all human, right? Yeah, of course. And we all, like, we're all going to do whatever we do. But I think where what it falls into is, like, we don't really have much <coughs> – excuse me. We don't really have much say-so into – the marketing and promoting that goes behind us. So me being in contract with UFC, they can go and promote any, they can promote me however they want. Yeah. You get me? It's not me. It's not me Mm -hmm. that's saying, Hey, I want to be promoted this way. It's like, no, they can take whatever highlights they want and they can put whatever commentary they want. And then whoever's watching ends up believing what they're saying. So John Jones, like, okay, cool, dude, like, if you do all of these things and that's just who you are, then cool, like, no judgment, like, we're all fucked up, but I think what happened with him is just, like, now it's, like, he got promoted as, like, all of this stuff through the UFC, and then when his, like, when his human side came out, now it's, like, ah, shit, this guy's not what they told us, (laughs) you get me? It's, like, it's so, it's so weird, man. Well, how about like for instance, like in boxing, right? Like, like Mayweather, like he's got Mayweather promotions, so he's in charge of how he's promoted. Yeah, he dictates he's not his owned image. By, yeah, he's not owned by anybody. If he wants to promote himself, he can promote himself. He can do whatever he wants, and he chooses to promote himself as Floyd Money Mayweather. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. oh, billions yeah. of dollars and like throwing it on strippers and whatever he wants. He chose that image. No one gave that to him. Yeah. And he lives up to it. Okay, cool. You know what? I, I, people always are so surprised when they ask me, like, oh, who's your favorite MMA fighter? And I say Conor McGregor. And they're like, really? Why? He's such a douchebag. And I'm like, dude, whatever you want to say, the guy is a fucking boss. Oh, yeah. Like, <laughs> he has never changed. He talked shit even before the UFC. Like, he did all of these things, even in his past interviews when he was fighting for Cage Warriors and all this stuff. He's like, you know what? My goal is to make a bunch of money and, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. and and take over the world. And guess what? He fucking did it. And he's promoted himself. And he went over to make Mayweather promotions when he fought when he fought Floyd Mayweather. Like, he literally has taken control over his entire career and, and, and over MMA as a whole. So respect to that guy. Yes, you are my favorite fighter. You get me? Like <laughs> shout out to Conor like, McGregor. <laughs> shout out to Conor. And like, you know, do I do I respect his like outlook and his like his persona and all that stuff? Absolutely. Why? Because it's him. Now everybody else trying to follow in his footsteps, they can go fuck themselves. Exactly. Like, That's a big thing. And what he's doing and the and the thing that he's chose to do, he made an impact. He changed MMA forever. You get me? Oh, and yeah. it's like so but like but instead of people trying to replicate him, I think that we all need to be doing our own promotion and whoever's whoever's is like really stronger and gonna take over like you know and gonna like kind of change the 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 perspective on it, like then power to them and like and hats off. But for now, like yeah, Connor's done it. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, man. Yeah, you read you read my mind. I was gonna say the exact same thing. It's like way too many people are trying to imitate him, but the difference is he's being authentic. Where other people are kind of just putting on shows. Yeah, because they want to make money, right? Like, like 
they want to make the same money he's making. So they're like, oh, well, he's talking shit and he's doing this and he's being a douchebag. And it's like, yeah, well, he that's like who he is. So like whatever. Not saying that he's a douchebag because I think he's a good he's a cool guy. But like, you know, like, yeah, people are just trying to trying to be him and it'll never happen. No, no, no. You he's know? very unique. He, and like you said, he was unique way before. He he was calling his shots before ever in the UFC. He's like, I'm going to be UFC champion. I'm going to make all this money. And, you know, he he definitely dictated his own destiny. Uh, and then, like you said, though, changed the game and then crea- created all these imitators who are doing it horribly. Like, yeah. <laughs> and then polluting the whole game. Yeah, like they – and and – even if it's not like a hundred percent like imitators, I think that they took his message wrong and turned it into like pure disrespect where in him, it was just like, it was just like, I don't give a fuck confidence. Yeah. You get definitely. What I'm saying? Like his thing was like, an, I don't give a fuck confidence. And then when people would talk shit back to him or get triggered, then he would talk shit like yeah. that press conference with like Jeremy Stevens and stuff like he never straight up went to Jeremy Stevens. Was like, you know what? You're a piece of shit. He was like, I'm the best in the world. Nobody can touch me. He didn't say any names. And he's just like, anybody in this division, like, I'll take them out, blah, blah, blah. And then people started getting triggered. And then when they get triggered, then he never backed down. He's like, yeah, I'll slap you too. And like all this stuff. Like he <laughs> never, he never really like started th- anything personally. I think people just took what he was saying personal. And uh, now, like, I don't think that they really realize it. And now people are starting to just fire shots personally. And it's like, eh. he He was a mastermind at definitely changing the game. And yeah. And he like did getting it. what he wanted. <laughs> oh, God. I mean, he hasn't fought in how long. And he's probably made more money, unfortunately, than the, all the UFC fighters. Yeah, he's he genius. does. What he <laughs> yeah, for sure. That's so, I mean, goals, man. That's goals. Oh, yeah. You don't want to be beat up. Who I say it all the time. Like, you know, people are like, oh, why don't you fight, you know, Muay Thai? You, you train all these places. I'm like, I hate getting punched in the face. I, <laughs> I, I don't like it. You know, so with him, he, no one likes getting beat up. You know, maybe some fighters like need to get beat up to start fighting, you know, to give a reactionary thing or whatever it is. But nobody likes to be beat up. You want to be the guy beating people up. So he was like, ah, I'll make all this money. You know, and I don't have to get beat up, and I can make more money than all of you, and then I'll be out. And then you have to pay me so much more money to even see me again. Yeah. I mean, you can't you can't hate that at all. I mean, he says a lot of things and does a lot of things, but like you were saying, if you really look at what he did, it's reactionary. He's so cocky that people want to hate him, and then when they speak up, they can't keep up with his mouth. I mean, exactly. he is so fast. I mean, <laughs> yeah, we all knew that. Yeah, we all knew that one guy in school and stuff like that, or one of your buddies you hang out with, and he's always just fucking you up. Always yeah, talking exactly. shit to you. And you're like, yo, <laughs> like you get one good one on him, and he's like ripping you up for the rest of the day. You're like, damn. I God. shouldn't have said anything. <laughs> yeah, you're like, shit, you know, and he's talking about everything. Talk about your shoes. Talk about the way you walk. Why'd you say it like this? You know, it's just Connor is like that, and he's relentless, and that's how he takes people out of their game. And that's, you know, not that he's not a great fighter. But my God, outside of the cage, he's a great marketer. He's created yeah. so much. So, I mean, it's pretty amazing, but I don't even know how we got here. <laughs> but... <laughs> Just multiple things. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's... Yeah. it's... Oh!